Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz trumpeter, composer, and producer Thomas Marriott. We caught up with him in early January 2021 to talk about COVID, his latest 2020 CD, Trumpet Ship, and his life in music. He is a veteran of the national jazz scene, and he's earned seven Golden Ear Awards, produced 11 albums as a leader for Origin Records, and toured with the greats like Maynard Ferguson, Roy McCurdy, as well as giants in the world like Warren Evans and Joe Locke. Get to know him and dig this interview. Well, thanks for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. Not at all. Your latest album, Trumpet Ship, you know, I think everything last year that came out, you know, is, is rather unique because of the pandemic. So talk to me a little bit about a artistic pandemic release. Well, I can tell you, I certainly didn't plan on releasing Trumpet Ship during the pandemic. I had actually started planning the release in 2019. Uh, by booking a tour and, you know, obviously um, the record label intended for the album to be released in uh, March of 2020. Um, And as you know, releasing an album takes a lot of pre-planning. The album was actually recorded a number of years ago um, and it had kind of sat in the can while I worked on a a couple of different projects. Um, The opportunity came up to record the music kind of on the spur of the moment. So I took advantage of the opportunity to to get the band into the studio. Um, and then the album sat for a while. And when I finally sort of made plans to to release it with the record label, and I booked a tour, um, I had six cities. Uh, I had vinyl copies, <laughs> you know, sent to different cities. So they would be there when I went on tour and all of those things. And then actually ended up having to cancel the tour the morning I was supposed to leave for the first um, destination, which was Chicago. You have to really be creative with what you do online because uh, that's pretty much where all the eyeballs are uh, during the pandemic. Everybody's kind of sitting in front of their screen. So you do what you can. I mean, I don't know that it was necessarily a smashing success uh, commercially. I, I still feel very confident about um, artistically where the music is. But, uh, you know, without a really solid sort of uh, publicity machine, it's very difficult because you are uh, certainly competing for a lot of eyeballs out there. What do you want the audience, the, the those that download and buy this album to get ultimately from what you have created with this project? My feeling is that trumpet ship and really all music is a way to get outside of yourself. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I like about music in general. I think that's, you know, especially true for the jazz listening audience is that music is a way that we, uh, get outside of ourselves and change our state of being uh, without the use of chemicals and all of that. My hope is that somebody who has a copy of Trumpet Ship, uh, you know, it's a 43-minute program of music that goes to a lot of different places. And my, my feeling is that somebody who put this on would have a journey through time and space. And I feel like that is exactly what we do in a live performance as well. It's sort of we try to mingle uh, the past, present, and future all together in a single moment. And we do it in a moment of time on the bandstand that, that is very fleeting. Obviously, with Trumpet Ship, it's a recording, so it's a little more tangible. But as a program of music, I would hope that it's it's a journey uh, outside of yourself uh, when you listen to it. And as far as what we all need during this pandemic, you know, it's an inside job from here on out until everybody's vaccinated, right? Uh, almost all of our living is done inside and and most of our exploration has to be done inside of our own heads unfortunately but what better way to do it than music how did you get the jazz bug how did how did all of this start for you where where did it sink in well i feel very fortunate in that um i sort of come from a musical family my dad's parents were both professional musicians Uh, one was a classical pianist the other was jazz pianist and Growing up, my dad had a very extensive jazz record collection. He was a jazz DJ for some years. And, of course, dad's vinyl collection was totally off limits to me and my brother as kids. So we listened to it (laughs) at every chance we got. Um, It was taboo, but we also just were enthralled by some of the silly names on the records. Dizzy Gillespie and Zoot Sims and who are these people, you know. So at a very young age, we started digging into my dad's record collection before I played an instrument or anything. And since we had instruments in the house, um, I played a little piano and uh, about seven or eight years old, I discovered the trumpet in the closet and 
my dad and grandfather sort of coached me on how to get going on it because they played both played that instrument. Um, and they would take me to jazz clubs at a very young age. And I remember distinctively going to hear Floyd Standifer, uh, one of our departed sort of local heroes here in Seattle. When I was in 12 or 13 and just thinking that I had found my people, you know. Um, my uncle was also really into jazz, my dad's brother, and they would blindfold test us, me and my brother. So they put on some sunny stit, you know, and say, okay, who is it? And what's the name of the tune? And who's the piano player? Uh, when I was really young, like 12 or 13, and I feel really grateful for that because it had um, given me an opportunity to be a fan first. And I feel like it's the job of the jazz musician to be a fan of the music first, um, to really understand the passion uh, behind it and to know what motivates you to play it. Um, but that's how I got the jazz bug, you know, from a very early age. So long ago that it's hard to remember a time in my life uh, where jazz wasn't sort of all-consuming. You know, the one thing that's always good about hearing a story like this is kind of the dream realized. You know, you ended up touring with Maynard Ferguson. You've been around, been around Warren Evans and the great Joe Locke. What is it like? This is kind of a two-fold question. What is it like to finally be able to perform and tour with your heroes? And then what did they give you that you, in turn, give younger players? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I tried to do what most of my mentors told me to do, and I feel lucky to have had a lot of mentors. And they said, you know, you've got to move to New York, you have to go on the road, you have to pay your dues, um, you have to do all of those things. Um, so I, I tried to, you know, I took that to heart and I did all those things. That's not a thing that we really tell people, to young people, to do anymore. The, the concept of you have to go on the road and be a side man or side person, excuse me, and sort of um, apprentice, you know, sort of learn on the job, working your way up. We don't really teach that anymore. We teach kids to go in the practice room and practice their stuff by themselves, and then they come out of college or whatever, and then they start making records um, with usually very little experience as a leader or as a side man. So um, what was it like for me? Oh, it was eye-opening, obviously. Your commitment to what you do gets tested over and over and over again, and especially when you're on a road gig like Maynard's Band or, you know, I was on Rosemary Clooney's gig, a Spanish Harlem Orchestra. Like, those are those are pretty intense road gigs. Um, you know, you, you basically get paid to ride the plane, and the gig at the end of the day is the highlight. Um, so you better be damn well sure this is what you want to do with the rest of your life. And I I feel lucky to have had that commitment tested. Um, it always gets tested, you know, like it's being tested right now, obviously, as it is for all of us. Um, but if there's one thing that I feel like um, what I have gained in that experience is to know the difference between merely playing music and giving a performance. We really feel strongly that our audience is the most important thing and that we have to connect on the bandstand. So I feel like standing behind a band leader who is very powerful at doing that, at communicating and at connecting, um, it's something you can kind of only see in the moment, um, sort of at the feet of a master, you know what I mean? And while I don't necessarily claim a lot of expertise in that regard compared to some of the band leaders that I've worked under, I do definitely see how all of the pieces of the puzzle um, of giving a performance make a huge impact on the audience. And so if there's anything that I try to do by example is to sort of try to try to follow their lead in that regard. In other words, I want my band to be prepared. I want to be prepared. Um, I see a lot of like young musicians with music stands, and I feel like that's um, insulting to the audience not to have your own music memorized, especially if it's your own original compositions. Um, I know it's not always possible, obviously, if you're dealing with you know, we don't really have bands anymore in jazz. We have some, but for the most part, the emphasis because of the media um, and record labels and the industry sort of forced it to be about individuals. And that's really too bad, too, because the music was never really about individuals. It was always about band concepts. Um, and so I feel like if you have a band as a band leader, you're responsible for making sure that it sounds like a band and it looks like a band and what you deliver is a is a group message to your audience, not just you backed up by three people. You know, the one thing that's very clear is that you have a very profound love for jazz and 
as a listener and a fan and then as a performer. What do you like the best about being a performer, about waking up every day being a musician? What I love about it most, I think, is that it it is a it is something with limitless, it has a possibility for limitless expansion. In other words, in this entire time in the pandemic that I've just basically been home like everybody else, um, it hasn't been a time that's been wasted. Uh, we always have more to learn. There's always digger to, to deep. I mean, there's always, you could always dig deeper, I should say. Um, there's never a ceiling to what you can do. And I think that some of our, our great masters of the music have, have proven that over and over and over again. There's, there's always more. Um, there's, there's more you can do technically, there's more you can do harmonically, and there's more you can do spiritually with the music as well. So all of those things are tools to communicate with people. So to me, the best thing about being a musician is that you get to affect the state of being of other people through music. And that's, if that's your goal, it's a lofty goal, but it's, it's one you takes a long time to chip away at. And I'm patient. I keep at it. You know, I think that's one of the best things about it. So if you had a dream tonight and you, well, and you ran into your younger self, like right before you started gigging and getting your career off the ground and you could give your younger self one bit of advice, what would it be? <laughs> well, I'd probably be more of a personal nature, honestly. I don't know that I necessarily want to get into all of those details uh, in an interview. I think most of the advice I'd give myself would be of a personal nature. Not that I, I did, definitely did not do everything perfectly, and I don't think that anybody can, so I think that's probably an unreasonable expectation. And honestly, I feel like maybe looking back, I, there's a saying a friend of mine likes to say is that it's okay to look back, but don't stare. Um, and I feel like thinking about where I was, you know, you've got to make an, a decision to do this at an, when you're at an age where you really aren't capable of making that kind of life decision. Um, but I did anyway. Um, and I, I feel like I was fairly impatient about it, as most young people are. So I guess if there's one thing I could say is I would try to teach myself a little bit of patience. When we do return to live music, you get back on the stage and we're in the audience. What do you hope we realize about the absence, this long absence of live music? You know, I, I, I think that there is a common mentality among musicians. When we play, we tell people, thank you for supporting, you know, the arts. Thank you for supporting live music. Thank you for supporting live jazz. And I think that's totally backwards. As musicians, we support the people. We are the spiritual healers of the people who are sitting in the audience, the people who listen to our music. And the idea that we could all be crammed in a little space and that a band can be doing its damnedest to help us make, to help make us feel as human and as alive as possible. You cannot get that from a video and you cannot get that from a recording. It has to be experienced in person in the moment where there's smelly, stinky people next to you and somebody's breathing on you and somebody's spilling a drink and you see for yourself the communication happening between the musicians. I don't know, there's to me there's nothing like it. I mean, even even myself, I'm craving it, you know, live music. I mean I listen to lots of music but it's not the same. I'm I'm just as anxious to go hear some as I am playing it. But I think what what I hope that we all come out of this understanding is what a necessary uh, element live music is and actually all performative arts are to the human condition. We need that to get outside of ourselves. We need a place to escape to. I like live jazz because it's not so stuffy. It's a place where people relax and have a good time. Uh, you can dress up. You can dress down. Uh, you can sip a drink or whatever is your fancy. Uh, it's not the opera, it's not the ballet, and you can engage with the musicians. In fact, the whole point is to engage, to have a two-way dialogue, the band and the audience. I don't know where else you get that besides church, I guess. Um, certain kinds of church, I should say, not all kinds of church, but uh, it's that kind of connection with music, musicians, that I think people are going to really uh, be flocking back to. If you could get to a time machine, a DeLorean pulls up in front of your house, you punch the digits, 
you punch the time and place. Where are you going? Who are you going to go see live? Well, I don't future trip. That's uh, something that keeps me sane is I try not to think too far down the road. Um, but I uh, I want to see my friends play. Um, and as far as the time machine, you know, I am somebody who tries to go see everything that happens. I mean, in Seattle, there's not tons of jazz offerings, so it's not too tricky to do. But I like to make the hang. And I think that's a huge part of of the music is the is the social aspect of it. Um so for me the who is 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 really not that important. I just want to go see my see my see the people. You know what I mean? I want to be amongst the other people. I want to I want to make the hang. I want to shoot the breeze um with the folks that are there, the band and the audience. You know, I mean when I go to a jazz club, I always see somebody I know. Even if I go to another city, I always see somebody I know. And in that way I sort of feel I'm gratefully feel like a part of the sort of global jazz community. It's not that big of a community. You know, if you start talking to somebody pretty soon you find out that you have a connection to them through somebody else, uh, if you're sitting in a jazz club. So I, I just welcome the opportunity to be amongst other people, uh other like minded people. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans that you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? I'm Thomas yeah. Marion. Who do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't really, you know, it's not a question I really ask myself. Who do I think I am? I think that's for other people to decide. I know who I am. I'm Thomas Marion. And, you know, I'm not sure what you want me to say in this question. It's, I think it's more of the the, the genesis of this question is, there's so many times that we do what we do in our lives and we're the ones that are living our lives, but everyone around us has this perception of what we do. We have different roles. We play different pieces in people's lives, but we ultimately are the, the ones that are leading it. And I guess it's more of that kind of thing. I guess I would say that what other people think of me is none of my business. You know what I mean? I can't control what other people think about me. How other people see me is really not something that I... I really try hard not to spend too much time thinking about. I obviously um, like to connect to people, but if what their opinion is about things is not really is not really my place. As far as who do I think that I am, I'm a I'm a musician, and I and I guess we could talk about what does that mean to me, because I think that that means different things to different people, but. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm a musician. I'm, I'm somebody who is trying to use music to affect the feeling of another person. That's it, man. That's the answer. That, that nails it. Thomas, thank you for taking a minute out from the Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We'll give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Thomas for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.